Matt, if you make sure you're muted, that's coming from you or not. That's coming from Hey, can you hear me? Hey, me? Okay. All right. Can you welcome hear me. Yes. All right. So uh, you can introduce yourself for the record, and then uh, we'll get going. All right. My name is Matt Shambaugh. I'm a retired chemist. I worked with the Agency of Agriculture for 30 or so years as uh, their lead pesticide chemist for most of that time, dealing with uh, mostly regulatory issues with misuse of pesticides. So well, you had to deal with anything and everything that came through the door. Because it was a small state, we had to regulate all pesticide use. So I had uh, everything from a, a game warden bringing in a truckload of dead turkeys to uh, pieces of telephone poles to uh, maple sap uh, tubing that was contaminated to uh, the state police brought in a whole uh, contents of a whole kitchen to test for poisoning pesticides. So you name it. We had to do it over the years. Um, but in particular, I want to start by talking about what sort of got me where I am today, which is uh, 20 so or so years ago, there was a, a problem with deformed frogs in Lake Champlain Basin. And the immediate uh, thing was that everybody jumped to the conclusion that that was a pesticide issue. Uh, so there were frogs with missing legs, extra legs, missing eyes, et cetera. Pretty sad. Uh, so DEC, along with the Agency of Ag and Middleburg College, got a grant from EPA to, to look into what was might be causing the problem. We never really found the solution, but it wasn't pesticides that we could tell, um, which is good. <laughs> but an unforeseen circumstance or side effect was that we found atrazine, which is used on corn in Lake Champlain in early spring. So. Tiny amounts, but it was not what we were expecting. It's certainly not what I was expecting. Uh, so that started the agency's concern about pesticides in surface water. And uh, Phil Benedict, who was the uh, program director at the time, gave me the go-ahead to try and investigate uh, what was going on with pesticides in, in the Champlain Basin in my <clears throat> spare time. I wasn't doing regulatory issues. Uh, generally speaking, uh, anytime you're using pesticides, they're going to end up somewhere where they don't belong at some level. Um, generally speaking, again, what we found was that the worst contamination, whatever you want to call it, the highest levels were found in small streams after big rainfall events. Uh, but most of those were tiny amounts, not a serious concern. I a question here from Representative O'Brien. Just quickly, atrazine is like what family? Is it organophosphate or it's an triazine herbicide? So it's a weed killer used on corn almost exclusively. Uh, okay, so um, my concern has always been yes, we can detect these because the 
agency has a state-of-the-art lab, they can detect tiny amounts of pesticides. Uh, but when should we be worrying about that? So after I retired in 2016, I got hired by the Lake Champlain Basin Program to do a literature review of basically all we could, all I could find about pesticide use in Vermont in the Champlain Basin and other organic contaminants. So what do we know about organic contaminants in the waters of Lake Champlain? And after that, I, on my own, I did an assessment to try and figure out of those things that have been detected, which ones are things we should be worried about. I'm not going to talk about that today, but if anybody's curious, I can certainly come back. Uh, so I'm talking about neonics today. Um, you all know that they're systemic. They get into the plant, make the plant poisonous. Uh, they avoid large broadcast spraying of insecticides because you're targeted because it's right on the seed. Uh, a wonderful idea when it was invented because it was reducing the use of organophosphates and other really nasty things. And they're non, not toxic to humans, so or to mammals in general. So wonderful uh, concept. Uh, uh, the unintended consequence was that the whole plant is toxic for the whole lifetime of the corn plant, for instance, including the pollen and the nectar. So any insect that consumes any of that plant can get killed by it. So that's. Uh, unintended. <laughs> uh, these compounds are, are very water soluble. They're very persistent. They get into our water uh, because only a few percent of the neonic on the corn seed actually gets into the plant. Most of it stays in the soil, gets into the ground and surface water and contaminates our environment with 90 plus percent of the neonic that's being applied to each corn seed is ending up where it doesn't belong. Again, they're toxic to pollinators. They're toxic to aquatic insects. They are persistent, so they stay around. And we are finding them in the water, soil, and pollen in Vermont. Uh, very briefly, the, uh, the proposed alternative to neonic seed treatments are the diamide insecticide seed treatments. Uh, I'm not going to say the name of them. I'm just going to call them diamides because they're too complicated to try and pronounce, um, but their the proposed replacement there is actually one of them mm -hmm. on the market already as a seed treatment, sometimes by itself and sometimes with a neonic. Uh, generally speaking, they both work the same way in that they're both systemic. Both neonics and diamides are systemic. They get into the plant, make the plant toxic. Uh, diamides are a newer generation, so we don't know as much about them as we do neonics but they're both stable, they're both water soluble, they get into the groundwater, the surface water, just the same way. Uh, neonics are more toxic to honeybees, so that's why from a honeybee and a pollinator perspective, diamides are better than neonics. But on the flip side, diamides are more toxic to butterflies. So, and they're both extremely toxic to aquatic insects. So there's trade-offs there. I, <clears throat> Yeah, just quickly, what, what is stable in that context? They, they don't break down really quickly. So if it gets into the soil and isn't uh, exposed to the sun, they'll stay there for a year or more in the soil. And in the water, it depends on how much sunlight and how much oxygen they get. Stay, but but uh, typically, the it's a called a half-life. And half-life in soil of these things is half a year to two years. So that's why you see the halo effect that you've heard about is that they will stay around for more than a year. So they will have an effect a year from now, even if you're not applying them potentially. And glyphosate then goes away much quicker. Glyphosate goes away very quickly and it only is effective on the growing plant. So in the soil, it doesn't affect the plants. Uh, atrazine does as a weed killer, it will stay around for a year and it will affect future growth, but a glyphosate, you have to spray it on the growing plant <clears throat> to work. So this is interesting to hear you talk about half-life and this, it might relate to the halo effect. Um, so I think you said half, half a year to two years? Yeah, it, 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 
somewhat variable depending on the test conditions. That's okay. Experimental. So at the high end, then at the sort of the slow end, after two years, it would be half as toxic. Is that half as much? Half as much. Okay. Not necessarily half as. It depends <laughs> how high it was to start with, whether it's toxic or not. Okay. <laughs> right. So if there's way up here, half of way up here is still way up here. And if the toxicity level is down here, you're still going to be toxic. So it all depends on how much. Yeah. Is. Thank you. And, <clears throat> and what determines the difference between the slower and the faster um, breaking down? It's the chemistry of the molecules. Of the particular, yeah, whatever type you yeah. have. Yeah. The diamide, which the, you know, Nick, they all have their own half lives. So, uh, the neonix, imidacloprid, clothianidin, thiamethoxane, right? The common ones, they all have a different half life. Uh, they stay around, but they're all what's called stable. Uh, that's how EPA defines them. They don't break down really quickly. Some compounds will break down in a week, these will break down in months to years. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, so this is just one brief example of the kind of data that's out there. This was a study on monarch butterflies uh, where they monarchs eat milkweed leaves. So the, the larvae, uh, this lab experiment, they sprayed different insecticides on milkweed leaves and fed that to monarch larvae. And the, the uh, diamide insecticide was 100 times more toxic to the larvae than the Neonic. So again, monarch butterflies and other butterflies, the diamides are extremely toxic. Uh, we have a question from Representative Levitt, who's uh, on, on the screen behind you. Okay. Um, I guess my, my question is sort of about half life. And I'm thinking about Quebec farmers who aren't using treated seed and they're not seeing any reduction in crop yield. And I'm wondering. Is there a slight possibility that could be from residual neonics in the soil? I would say only for the first year after they were being used. Okay, that's what I wanted to know. Thank you so much. Yeah. Okay, quickly again, related to that milkweed. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. sorry. That's okay. So on the same level of the persistence in the soil, um, I believe it was an experiment that uh, Heather Darby uh, conducted on a field that apparently had never received mm. neonicotinoid, but they found, I think it was six, is it six UG or, yep. or six, grams per right. Per, per billion. And, and I'm not sure what the volume of soil, but, but it's still um, a negative level, according to some of the other things that we've shown, could still have a negative impact on uh, bees. Right. Um, so the idea that that half life is a year or two, how did this get there, and and why is it persisting? Like it, this isn't matching up. Okay, so uh, from I haven't talked to Heather, but okay. I saw her testimony about it. Um, my understanding is the fields where they that they were doing this study on had never been planted in corn before, mm -hmm. so there couldn't have been any neonics from previous seed, neonic treated seeds, okay. corn seeds, but it was used for ornamental plants. Uh, and uh, ornamental plants, it used to be before we, uh, here in Vermont, you all uh, made them restricted use. They were used on ornamental plants all the time. And if you went to Home Depot and bought a potted plant, it was probably treated with neonics in wherever it was grown. Uh, and it might still be the case. So if it was grown in a greenhouse in Atlanta, in Georgia, and brought up here to be sold, it might have neonix in it because they put it right into the soil to keep plants to keep free. So that's, I think, what Heather hypothesized, and that's the logic solution, that whatever was planted in that field before had some neonix. But I do understand it was quite some time since anything was planted in that Field. Like, do I remember correctly? Twenty years? I don't know. It, I mean, it, it was quite. I don't remember. Yeah. You know, anything about that? Actually. Just that it wasn't okay. used for corn. Is the only thing. Okay, but 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 so this half life of one to two years is still. I mean, 
if we're getting uh, that amount from testing, probably there was something there in the last five years. Yeah. Okay. Fair that enough. Was, I guess. Okay. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. Probably the last two or three. Okay. Okay. Um, this is just very briefly. So, chlorantrimilaprol uh, is very toxic to monarch butterfly larvae. Uh, in a separate study in California where they looked at actual milkweed plants grown all across the state and they found a quarter of those plants uh, had enough chlorine trimilaprol to be toxic to monarch butterflies. So uh, there are a you know, different use pattern out there. It's sprayed on crops out there. So that's not totally relevant to here, just showing that it does get up into the milkweed at toxic levels potentially. Um, okay. Very briefly, you've heard this before, Agency of Ag has tested pollen and they found propionidin, one of the neonics in pollen. UVM B Lab has tested pollen and they found neonics in pollen in Vermont. Uh, again, very briefly, you, uh, seed treatments in general, not just neonics, but all seed treatments are contrary to the concept of integrated pest management, which is use a pesticide when it's needed after you have evidence that it's needed. Um, seed treatments, if they're used the way they're currently used, are contrary to that, and we shouldn't be allowing pesticides to be used indiscriminately all the time, in my opinion. <laughs> and uh, it's contrary, again, to what you all and the people of Vermont have said they want, which is to preserve biodiversity and do regenerative soils in agriculture. You can't have either of those in agriculture if you're killing off the insects and the fungus in the soil all the time. It's not gonna be appropriate biodiversity in that soil. And some sacrifices have to be made to be able to grow things, of course, but not indiscriminate all the time, <laughs> in my opinion. Um, so you've heard about seed treatments and the uh, neonics effect on honeybees, possibly. Um, I'm not sure you've heard much about the aquatic insect side of things, but I'm going to talk about that very briefly. Uh, clothianidin, which is the most commonly used neonic seed treatment in Vermont, uh, is very toxic to midges and mayflies and other aquatic insects, which are the basis of the food chain of our streams and lakes in Vermont. Uh, two general concepts uh, to get across our concentration, LC50, which is the lethal concentration of a compound that will kill half of the organisms in an experiment in a lab. So whatever concentration will kill half of them. And the lowest observable as adverse effect concentration is less than a toxic level. So it's lower value than the LC50, but it's something that an experimenter in a lab can show that there is an effect. So think uh, behavior, physiology, uh, how many eggs a creature lays, how quickly it grows, how fast its heartbeat is, how well it swims, all those things are effects that can be measured. <laughs> uh, Agency of Ag has been testing neonics, has been testing streams for pesticides for 20 plus years, for neonics for 10 years. And uh, in the last two years, just looking at that data in particular, uh, in some of the ag impacted streams in the Franklin County area up by St. Albans, they are finding both the antidote in the streams at greater than the lowest observable adverse effect concentration routinely. Uh, so not necessarily enough to kill the insects, but enough to be affecting them. And actually in, in Mill River, which is a straw, small river that feeds into St. Albans Bay, they found uh, clothianid in, in that stream once in the last two years at greater two times the LC50. So it was almost certainly causing some death to aquatic insects from that. Um, uh, so Toxic to bees, toxic to aquatic insects, persistent, mobile, and high concentration in waters after storm events, potentially. Um, the Agency of Ag 
The Agency of Ag said in their report to you all in 2015, Vermont should be prepared to exert regulatory oversight to take corrective action when treated articles present unacceptable risks to the environment, pollinators, or human health. And I would argue that it is clear that we've already passed that threshold, that these are a clear danger to our environment in Vermont, and we need to do something about it. And that's based on Vermont data, not some far off place where it might be different environmental conditions. So H706, I think, is a necessary next step forward on dealing with uh, issues of pesticides in our environment that are that we that are a concern. I like the fact, of course, that there are exemptions in the bill. You need to have exemptions because you need to be able to use these at times, uh, but it shouldn't be too easy. Uh, so I like what New York has done where it's a farm by farm exemption. You have to demonstrate that you have an issue before you can use these things. Um, I like that doing it in lockstep time-wise with New York. So if they're changing to 2029, that makes sense for us to do that too. Um, the one substantive thing I, I would suggest you do if you're gonna move forward on this bill is that you don't eliminate the BMPs, which is part of this bill. It says to remove that requirement. I think no matter, and I would change it slightly to say all neonics, I mean, all seed treatments, mm -hmm. you should have a best management practice for it. No matter what is on the seeds, it's not just neonics because the diamides are going to come in in a few years and you're going to have the same or similar issues five or 10 years from now that those are causing problems. <clears throat> so keep in the BMP requirement that if they're going to be used, they should be used appropriately. Mm -hmm. um, and so again, when are we going to say enough is enough? We need to do something about these. Think like state of Maine does. Think first, spray last. So don't mm -hmm. use pesticides unless it's needed. That's it. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you, Representative Tuplin. So um, <clears throat> clearly, the point of of your testimony is to talk about the DNA component and the diamide alternative. But you did mention the herb. I'm sorry, the fungicides on seed treatments. And that is of particular concern to me because of soil mycology and the effect that it might have on living soil. So can you speak on that a little more? Uh, a little. Okay. <laughs> um, I haven't uh, thought about that aspect very much recently, mm -hmm. but they are systemic as well. Oh. Um, so, so they get into the plant, at least some of them are systemic. So some of them will get into the plant. Some of them are designed to stay right around the seed and protect the soil around the seed and kill off any microbes, fungus, and so the seed doesn't get moldy as it's trying to grow. Um, but again, some of those are quite toxic to non-target organisms, not just fungus, mm -hmm. but other things. And some of them stay around for a while. So again, that's why I would suggest that we need BMPs for seed treatments, period, not just you know, mixed because they all are treated with fungicides of one sort or another. And at least currently they're all, I'm talking corn now, uh, they're all treated with neonics. And that will, trans if you don't do anything, that will maybe transition to diamides instead of neonics because of the bad press about neonics. But uh, it's a big picture problem that they shouldn't be used unless there's a reason for it and should be thinking before you use them. Mm -hmm. Representative Wilson. Uh, yeah, I have two questions. Uh, what, in your opinion, would you advise be done? And also, is this damaging to birds or anything else, fish? So uh, there's definitely indirect effects on fish. If you're getting rid of their food, which are the midges and the mayflies and so on, you're destroying the food chain potentially. Um, uh, birds, uh, EPA in their risk assessment of neonics said that uh, seed-eating birds can eat a toxic amount of these if they're eating the raw seed off the field. Right? So you, uh, you know, crows will go into a field that's freshly seeded and go in and find those seeds and eat them. If they eat, I don't know what the numbers off the top of my head, you know, 10 or 15 of those, it might. <coughs> 
like enough to have an effect on them. And they would they do that. They learn how to search out a mm -hmm. food source. <laughs> um, just like the dead turkeys, which is not a neonic, but that was long ago. But uh, a farmer had an orchardist had put out uh, rat bait uh, to kill the mice that were nibbling on his fruit trees, and they didn't get buried quite well enough. So, so there were these piles of grain that a whole flock of turkeys found, mm. and they, you know, those are just like neonic treated seeds. They're brightly colored, um, so bright blue usually. Grain pellets. The uh, turkeys ate them and then went and roosted in a tree for the night. And somebody found a pile of dead turkeys the next morning. Mm. <laughs> Thirteen of them, all in under one tree. <laughs> and brought them all to me. <laughs> Luckily, I was able to dissect them and find those bright blue seed, uh, grain seeds in their crop. Oh, my. And so uh, that's beside me. <laughs> um, Chuck, can diamides be used in a foliar way? Yes. Yes. Uh, just like neonics. Yeah. Right? yeah. Um, and they are used quite a bit. I, I believe the orchardists that talk to you said that they use them in rotation in the neo mix to avoid resistance development. But I, they certainly are used many different crops and so, yeah. So the impact of diamides on monarch butterflies is not something that we're, it's considered in this bill. Right. Um, but the, there's nothing in the bill also that says that farmers could not make that transition or that seed companies could not sell treated seeds treated with something else. Right, yeah, right. And that's why I suggest you keep the BMPs in there. So that at least will be a start. So we don't get to this point without knowing what's going on. <laughs> Can you BMPs um, reference IBM at the moment? Uh, they're all written differently. So uh, that's the hard part is uh, writing BMPs that are effective. Uh, so, you know, I, I think if, if Agency of Ag had done what they'd been asked to, which was create BMPs for neonic treated seeds, we might not be here today if they were effective BMPs. So, you know, only use when you're needed, when they're needed, or when there's evidence of uh, corn uh, or whatever. Um, but I'm not a farmer, so I don't know the details of when, what appropriate EMP would be. In the race. Is it your opinion that the AIB is the proper? Place for the BMPs to be drafted, or do you have thoughts on somewhere else? That... So, uh, before the AIB was created, when there was the Vermont Pesticide Advisory Council, I advocated that they do that because they were at least a semi-independent entity appointed by the governor. Uh, AIB board is appointed by the Secretary of Ag. So whether there's any advantage to AIB doing it versus Agency of Ag doing it, I don't know. Um, but it has to be effective to be useful. You can't just say, I'm gonna document what I'm using and that's a BMP. <laughs> yeah, that's not in my mind. Hmm. All right. Uh, just, one quick, just to be devil's advocate, um, a lot of the farmers and the seed companies say that it sounds like IBM is reactive in nature, but they, they say that with that prophylactic sort of preventative, uh, they're using actually a lot less neonics than if there's a, a pest pressure and then they have to go to a foliar spread, which uses right. a lot more and it covers a bigger area. So yep. how do you see a way through that? So uh, I've been was doing that this job for a long time. Uh, so way back when I started, farmers did most of their own spraying. Uh, that transitioned from what I can remember when atrazine herbicide became a restricted use. Uh, so starting in the early 90s, farmers went to hiring Agway or whoever. Um, now what was that going with that? 
What was the question again? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> just, just that, you know. Oh, right. So, so the argument is that they used to spray a lot of nasty organophosphates all the time. And neonics replaced that. And the actual pesticide use data in Vermont doesn't really show that. Because and I don't know if any of you are longtime dairy farmers, but um, from what I remember, it wasn't an automatic you put uh, chlorpyrifos in with the seed every time you planted a seed. It was, you sprayed after corn came up and you saw that there was a problem. And then you did a broadcast spray. So it, it, it replaced a spraying when you had a problem with a really nasty chemical with applying this treated seed all the time, irrespective of the problem. So I, I, you only have to spray every five years in response to the seeds not growing well. That's better than every year in my mind. And, uh, but I was intrigued by the conversation you all had a, a week or two ago about uh, hay versus corn. Um, I know that's a, a long-term discussion, but the main use of pesticides by farmers is on corn. And if you can incentivize farmers to use, grow less corn and more hay, a shorter rotation or something like that, then you're gonna cut back on uh, corn herbicides and insecticides and, and other things. But that's a long-term discussion and I'm not a farmer, so I don't know any of the details of how to make that work. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. Yep. And if anybody has any further questions for me, my email was on the first slide of this. You're welcome to send me an email anytime. I love talking about this. Thank you. <laughs> very, very helpful. I appreciate it. So next up, we have the commissioner um, of the Department of Environmental Conservation. Yes. Colvin. Thank you. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair. You, were you, you visited us last year at some point. No, I was retired last year. <laughs> when, when did we, your name's familiar? I feel like. So uh, I was uh, the director of the warden service for eight years, retired in 2022. Um, got somehow talked into uh, coming and joining the conservation world again. Um, but I, I'm, I can't recall when I was before you, Mr. Chair. I might have been in that eight year span between. 2013 and 2022 sometime. Well, it could have been when I was here. And, and in any case, welcome. Thank you. Um, and uh, we, if you want, we're, we're all set to go. So if you want to introduce yourself formally and- Thank you. Yeah. Um, my name is Jason Batchelder. I'm the uh, DEC commissioner, new as of uh, right around October 1st, formerly of the warden service, retired um, after 21 years um, being a game warden. and. Um, and I'm had the fortunate um, or the good fortune to be here um, with within the agency and um, in charge of the DEC. I, um, I I don't think I recall meeting anyone except Representative Litsky. Um, which is nice to see you, sir. Nice to see you, I'm my neighbor. Uh, <laughs> but I'm uh, I'm afraid I'm I'm here to simply state a position and to and to briefly do that if I can answer questions. Uh, I will try. Uh, I will likely um, take notes and have someone um, with more technical expertise report back. Um, but I've, I've read the bill. Um, certainly, uh, the secretary and the deputy secretary um, have as well. And uh, we're double booked today, so they've asked me to, to simply state that the, the jurisdictional position that the bill has us in um, is a challenging one. If, if we were able to affect that, we would simply. Uh, remove ourselves from the exemption portion and any um, any type of uh, enforcement uh, within this bill and have that placed squarely within AG. Um, it uh, I, I don't I don't know much about cross jurisdictional. Um, I was more on my game. I just said pollination, um, <laughs> but, I, but I'm not um, cross jurisdictional um, enforcement. But I but I understand that um, it can be clumsy and inefficient and. I, I, Simply stating, simply put, um, if we could affect that, we would greatly appreciate it. Uh, thank you, um, Representative Rice. So I, I 
I can respect that uh, position. And I also think perhaps this is a question that you'll have to take notes and <laughs> bring, bring back somebody else. But I guess my concern is um, sort of outside of this bill then, um, you know, my understanding is that that's the position of the Agency of Natural Resources because pesticides are regulated by the Agency of Agriculture. And I, and I understand that, but I think also we know that pesticides are regulated by the Agency of Agriculture through a lens that is ag agricultural, right? So beneficial to ag agricultural uh, economics, right? And so my question is just, where do we go then if we're looking for answers, expertise, um, concern, regulation around the impact of the use of pesticides on biodiversity. Sure. I'll take a, a short swing and then I will refer that and we'll some, have someone get back to you. I, I don't believe our position is, is con, to be construed in any way to not be helpful in that, in, the, in those asks and in, in that lens. I mean, we certainly share with ag the responsibility for all things clean and, and pesticide free and, um, for all the benefits. Um, and I have people that do that and, and ag does too. I don't think that this, that our position here that I'm stating today stands to obstruct that, but I will ask someone more important than me and I'll get back to you. You're welcome. Other questions? Representative O'Brien. Mm -hmm. Commissioner, this is maybe not specifically connected to this, but we hear a lot, you know, in my town about DEC enforcement and that whether it's junkyards or farmers taking gravel out of the river or putting it back into the river, sir, that that you're you're way understaffed. So is is this going to be an ongoing thing, or can you give us some some sort of idea of just how understaffed you are? Just because enforcement would be part of this, I guess. Certainly. Um, <clears throat> I, I, I thank you for that question, and it's, and it's something we get asked quite a bit. Um, what I am coming to understand is, is that the staffing issue is directly related to the amount of work that is put upon us annually. And if that would, um, if that role would slow a bit, then the staffing we currently have would be able to handle the tasks we have in front of us. But um, it's compounded annually. And so I, I know that's a wishy-washy answer, but... Um, within our staffing levels, we have tremendous capability to do the tasks that we have in front of us as they are, are heaped on, for lack of a better term, and that thing, things get more challenging. Um, enforcement will, will certainly um, come into play depending on which way this bill goes. Um, I, I would say um, it's, it's a challenging position to be in to, to simply ask for more positions, right? For me, I think everyone understands that. We have extraordinary individuals. We have the ability to get the work done that we have in front of us. Our challenge is the work we face. And so if I can leave it at that, that that's my answer. There's a sense that you're falling further and further behind. I mean, without seeing there's potential. Situation. There's potential for it with the amount of work that is on the horizon. No doubt about it. I can, I can comfortably state that. I think we heard in, in terms of the bill, I think we heard a consistent response from the Agency of Agriculture Absolutely. Market. So that's uh, good. And uh, if there aren't any other questions, I don't think we need to keep you. Appreciate your Thank you. making the time to come over and you stay record. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you all very much. Happy to come back anytime. If you keep working at that speed, you're going to have no problem at all. I do, have hard, I do have a hard stop coming up, so this is perfect. All right. Right. <laughs> Thank you all. Um, <laughs> Take care. So uh, we're, we've got some time set aside now to talk about H706 uh, and what changes we might want to make to it. Um, we've, I, I will say, I'll, I'll just start by saying we've heard um, you know, fairly consistently from a range of witnesses a support Support for the bill, uh, provided it matches a little more closely what's in the bill that New York State is now you know, working with. So that's a, a difference in finding and um, 
uh, difference in jurisdiction. So, so it's this question about which which agency. Um, any thoughts on on either of that? And, and just you know, in casual conversations that have taken place too, it, it seems like you know there, there may be a consensus among committee members and both of those cases at least too. And there may be other things that need to be uh, other things that aren't related necessarily to the New York State Bill or are, but just wonder what people are thinking. Yes. Um, Can I just ask a clarifying question? So yeah. the New York Bill, the way it's written now is that if a, if a farm wants an exemption, they're requesting either from essentially but Julie Moore, or Jason Batchelder, some sort of waiver to in, in New York State, the equivalent of that agency. Yeah. Okay. And it's farm by farm, so it's not if you know, say, a whole county in New York State had pest pressures. The instead of one farmer, maybe that the, there's just you know, yeah. the consensus is yes, this county is having these pressures, and then. That person, the the A and R person in New York, did they give a waiver to the whole county, or it has to be farm by farm? I'm not sure that I know the answer to that that question. Um, whether they have the ability to grant a waiver broader than just what you know the territory, the oh, that's land of one farm. Um, obviously, New York is bigger, so is there, I think there's that to you know be mindful of, but. Uh, yeah, it, it, there, so there definitely is that difference because there, New York has it more localized than ours, which is, I think, uh, the language is, you know, essentially to cover the state. So we can, you know, we, we want to think about that a little bit, Representative Rice. Well, just to clarify, so in the New York, I think in the New York bill, they, it's being issued sort of on a farm by farm basis, but it's not, I think the commissioner, basically it says, Commissioner may issue a waiver to allow the use of the seeds for production of agricultural commodities. And then what, what gets farm by farm specific is sort of the requirements like the waiver can only be granted if the farm owner has completed an IPM training, uh, there's been a pest risk assessment. Um, the seeds may only be planted on the farm property or properties identified in the pest risk assessment. So I think essentially like what could happen is the commissioner could um, do a pest risk assessment that covers a whole county, and then every farm in that county that has that has met the other thresholds, the, the IPM training would get that waiver. You know, so it could it acts in the same way in that it could cover a larger geographic area it, according to that pest risk assessment. And I think that that's essentially the same thing that's happening here because they the commissioner in 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 our bill has the ability to sort of name the geographic scope of the waiver. So it could be X County, or it could be, you know, the whole state, or it could, you know, depending on what that, what the sort of assessment has generated, what the, the risk is. Could, could a, a New York Farm Bureau or DFA farms, on, on behalf of their represented farmers, could they apply for an exemption? So it doesn't, my read of the New York language doesn't necessarily name who is requesting the waiver. Yeah. It's talking about who's granting the waiver and the sort of... But it's data-based too, right? Right. Yeah. And there's this risk, this pest risk assessment that's sort of driving the yeah, process. Um, maybe just go back to what I think of as the easier ones anyway. Uh, so we, we just heard the testimony from the commissioner confirming that the ANR thinks that the jurisdiction should be with the agency of ag. Um, we know that in New York State, the equivalent, ANR's equivalent, and I can never remember what it is. It's not called ANR, but the- It's the Department, Department of Environmental Conservation. Okay, so it's the DEC, and our DEC is part of ANR, so that also could be confusing. But in any case, New York State, their equivalent does it all, and we have ag doing it here. So how do how do folks feel about making the change in our bill from A and R will regulate to agency of ag regulates? I support. Yeah. 
<laughs> raising hands with questions or not question. Yeah. I'd like to speak actually. Question. Okay. Yeah, I I'm I don't know if I like it. I think um, you know, the motivation, as you said earlier, of the agency of agriculture is with that agricultural lens. And they're not looking at it through the wider perspective of the greater ecology of the state. So I, I understand the sentiments of the uh ANR, but, you know, who fills that void if we don't have that broader perspective? Um, Mike. So I think, I mean, I, I definitely understand the concerns, mm. um, but I also think that, like, if, we're, if we take the totality of what we've heard from Agency of Agriculture and our farmers who would be affected, if we're hearing sort of the same thing from everyone, we should we should perhaps try to take that sort of respectfully into mm -hmm. account. Mm -hmm. And then I think so. What I, what our job is is to make sure that the the process we're setting up for the granting of the waiver yes. is strong enough yes. that the waiver can't just sort of be granted willy nilly without, cool. without that sort of data backing up the the, the necessity of. It. And we'll have to tighten that up then. And I agree if that's the route. And it may be then the point that you were raising and that you're really reiterating now is a part is a bigger question too, mm. and and maybe that's a bigger question for another day. Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, I think just just to I mean the New York the reason DEC is in their bill is because DEC does all pesticide regulation. So that would you know perhaps it would be nice if. And I did all pesticide regulation that we could say, and, I, and they would have that broader view. But I think in the context of the agency of agriculture being the only ones dealing with pesticide regulation, it would it does sort of strike me as difficult to to then just kind of separate this one task off. Yeah, yeah. Any? Yeah, I mean, I same, and I I, I totally hear uh, both sides. I think there's a I think there's a fundamental, you know, idea of if if it was at A and R, they would see it through a certain lens, you know, which may not be as beneficial for farmers. And you know, there's there's a, something to think about there too, and vice versa. I think that in consultation language, with you know, I think it's important for them to work together. And I also think that I mean, it's our job to to uh, give the agency of agriculture guidance on how they're supposed to proceed with. Um, these things. So I think change, you know, working on those pieces are good, but it does feel, and from talking to um, a number of people, it, it just feels like, and we heard it from the farmers. I mean, the farmers would be certainly more comfortable with that um, because they're, they're feeling threatened constantly. And I think that's important. And then the agency of agriculture does have a a more structured, designed, and capacity for that sort of thing. They have a relationship with the farms, and they have a basic understanding of how the things work. I think it's important, but I I don't want to negate the the importance of of A and R also being at the table. So I think that is important. But I I agree with having it at the agency just because that's who deals with these things at this point. Uh, Josie. So um, hand one thing we haven't talked about, and I apologize if I've missed it, is under what circumstances would a farm get a waiver? So it's, uh, uh, go ahead if you want to try and answer the question. I was going to try and find the section, so, go ahead, Rodney. So if a, if a farm or farms went out scouting their fields, um, the pest in there that could destroy their crop, they could ask for a waiver to use the chemical they need to use to alleviate that. So they couldn't proactively get a waiver. It would have to be upon site of pests. That would be my assumption, yes. I think That's the only what I thought, too. I think the scenario in which they could perhaps proactively get a waiver is the is the seed availability right. case. If they're finding that the market isn't or doesn't have the, the, the untreated seed available, they could seek a waiver to, to purchase the treated seed. The language is undue financial burden, right? 
Yeah, yeah, I think Mike mentioned that. Um, and I think that's important because that's, you know, that's a concern that's come up that there, if what if there's no C, then I think that also would qualify for exemption. These are both two very different uh, timings, though. So imagine you find pests in your field. You're going to need an immediate response that you may not get if there is a uh, uh, elongated um, you know, period of time where they decide whether or not you can use a pesticide. Whereas when you're purchasing seeds well in advance, you may have that timing where you can ask for a waiver. I think that... Uh, yeah, I mean, I think I might. I guess I would just say that that's another, maybe another reason why it's it's best has with the agency of agriculture who understands things like the timeline by which farms are operating on the necessity to active expediency. Yeah. If expediency, yes. Yeah. I think we should also define um, undue financial hardship because one of the farmers the other day said, you know, it was twenty bag, it was twenty dollars more expensive a bag, and she she didn't seem to think that was a big deal, but other farms might find that to be prohibitive depending on how many acres they're planting. So I, I, I'm sorry. I just sort of feel like I'm, I'm trying to anticipate loopholes and I'm just wondering if we need to tighten up the language or really define, I don't know how you define an undue, undue financial burden, hardship to a particular farm because we don't know what their finances are. So, but I do just one last thing. I do think it should be with the agency of ag because they know everybody and they're familiar with the farmers and the agricultural practices. Ben, I don't know. I, I'd like a &R to be involved somehow, but I'm not sure how. So to your point about the cost, I mean, I think that, that, yeah, we want to not have it be too open-ended or unambiguous and open to, you know, interpretation that might not be what we're intending. But I also think that in, in reality, the untreated seed is going to cost less than the treated seed. And the, the, the $20 that she mentioned yesterday, I think it's probably due to the fact that there's just not a lot of untreated seed and there, there's no economy of scale in producing it. But it, it really, there's no reason for, for treated seed to be less than untreated because you've got to go through that process of treating, which should add cost to it. Uh, but but I still think your point is valid. So we let's flag that for for Mike for Brady. Um, Dave, did you have a hand up? Yeah, I was just thinking about the undue cost uh, issue, if that's the right terminology. Um, you know, I mean, maybe we we define that um, um, loss of loss of crop, um, av unavailability of seed. I mean, maybe we spell that out, right? Yeah, unavailability of seed. I mean, that seems pretty. And that's actually separately listed as a insufficient separately listed amount of commercially available seed not treated with pesticides is a is sort of separately listed after undue financial hardship. Okay, as a reason why. Right, uh, and and so I should just step back process wise here. Uh, Mike, uh, Representative Rice is going to report the bill, so he'll work with Michael Grady to come up with a new draft that we can look at um, tomorrow, hopefully. And so you'll take notes on this conversation, Mike, to bring to Michael Grady. Uh, John. Yeah, I just had three scenarios where I was thinking about waivers. And just, I mean, maybe we, I don't know how prescriptive we want to be on the whole, how waivers happen, but say, you know, I plant, I'm the farmer, I plant 110 day corn and I do a test plot or something, there's major corn maggot infestation. So I can seek a waiver to do a foliar spray, I guess. I can seek a waiver to plant 80 day corn, treated 80 day corn, or potentially could I, if I say couldn't get those things, I lose my whole crop, could I seek a waiver for the following year saying I want to use treated seeds? Um. Yeah, I, mean, I suppose if you planted a crop and had a corn seed maggot infestation that devastated your that, that devastated the crop, and then you didn't have an opportunity to replant, that would probably cause an undue financial burden. If if nothing else, yeah, I think that you probably. But uh, and again, this is all going to be it'll be developed at the agency, right? Okay. Right. 
Charles. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay, and then, well, if there's other thoughts on that, we can come back to it. But, but the other easy one, then, I think, is a question of do we line the timing up with New York State's timing? And, and again, I think that originally as the bill was drafted, that was the intent. When, when the bill was written last fall, New York states were different than they are now. And I think that the uh, drafter of the bill has said he would also be writing it differently today if, uh, if he, he were writing it today. So uh, any, any, anybody feel strongly either for or against that? Does anybody feel strongly against that? <laughs> okay. And, and just to clarify, I, mean, I think the place where the lining it up with New York is, is, is actually relevant is the treated seed part. Not the, re the rest of the bill, it's our sort of policy decision when do we want these things to go into effect. The only thing that's impacted by New York is the, the national seed market. The time. Right. We had a lot of uh, consistent testimony yesterday by, by all accounts, seemed to be very responsible and cutting edge big producers. Uh, and they, if I recall correctly, all advocated for aligning the, the calendar with New York State. So I would support that out of respect for their perspective, I would like to align with the New York State calendar. Okay. Um, Can I say one thing? Real yes, quick? sorry, Jesse. No, it's okay. I didn't put my hand up. Um, what if I like the idea of banning neonics for turf and ornamental grasses in 27 and then doing un, doing treated seed ban starting in 29. I, I think, I, I don't know. I just feel like we, we could do something in 27 that isn't as restrictive. And, you know, honestly, who who's going to be affected? Golf courses? And... I don't know. Yeah, I just, I just feel like we, I, I, I feel like we could find a compromise there. And that's maybe that's just, that's what I just said. <laughs> Was that the part to align with New York to, to push back to 29 is the treated seed piece and the rest, there is no reason. There's no tie. There's no connection to the New York bill in terms of timeline, because the reason the timeline is important in terms of treated seeds is the larger market seed, mar seed market. That's a play. Got which it. is not right. It, you just so. used a lot of words and you lost me in the middle there. So, but thank you. <laughs> I think we're aligned. I think, I think you two are aligned anyway. Uh, John? Just back to the ANR, AFM. Does it, does the language say in consultation with ANR, I think up to the way this now, like the way New York's was flipped, it said their DEC in consultation with the agency of ag. So, so the language else. now is ANR in consultation with ag. What we've kind of been changing is to say ag, and I think that is a decision. And what I've heard is that we should flip it, not cut A&R. Uh, right, okay. Uh, all right, good. So if those are the easy ones, are there hard ones, or, or are there things that we need to, uh, that, that anybody feels we should be making changes to? Representative Rice. So there's a, uh, in the, Current language in the waiver process, I'm on line, uh, page eight, line 12. Um, there's this sort of what I see as a kind of poison pill in the waiver process, which is the language that says that as part of granting this waiver, the currently the Agency of Natural Resources has to include a determination that the exemption order will not cause undue harm to pollinator populations, bird populations, ecosystem health and public health. I think all of what we're doing here is saying that these pesticides are causing undue harms to those ecosystems and populations. Uh, so I don't think it's a very effective exemption process to then say that they have to say that that's not happening in order to grant an exemption. So I would, I would um, propose just shifting that language just to saying that they have to include a determination of whether they're Exemption will do that. So that at least there is 
that's a statement on the record of saying we're making this exemption. It, you know, we know that it that is causing these harms to pollinator populations or populations. Um, but because of these sort of exacerbating cir circumstances, we're going to make the exemption. And I think that kind of helps get to the, the point of sort of making sure we're trying to rein in the number of exemptions or the scenarios under which they would grant exemptions, that they're going to have to say, we're granting this exemption, understanding that it is causing undue harm to all their populations. Jen? Uh, I want to go back to the turf thing because I, I've had constituents that have- Sorry, can, can we just- Well, let's, let's, let's note that. Okay. Well, yeah, uh, we do we need to resolve that, but go ahead, Jen. Uh, the, it seems like the committee is dismissing concerns of golf courses, and I do not stand with dismissing their concerns. And what happens if there's a uh, major infestation where I think it was referred to as burrowing by uh, or tilling by skunks? Uh, is that not an undue hardship for a golf course operator? Jed, I'd like to think that that's where they could apply for a waiver. One thing a lot of the golf course guys said is they're spraying and they're treating prophylactically before they even see the white grub. So I think along the lines of what we're saying for, for farmers is if you see something, then we'll let you do it. But we're not going to let you sort of prophylactically use neonics on the off chance these grubs might show up. I'm not, and I, I certainly don't want to harm golf courses. I, I, I don't, I didn't, sorry if, if I came off, like, I don't care. Um, but I feel like they are spraying prophylactically and treating prophylactically and maybe they don't have to. Oh, you know, the testimony I heard, they uh, sprayed, I don't know if you'd call that prophylactically or not, but once a year, usually around the second week of July. So I mean, prophylactic spraying would be spraying without having scouted for and determined that there's a pest based need for. Um, uh, I, would, I would tend to agree with, with Rep Levitt that the protection there is the waiver process and also the ability to use non neonicotinoid pesticides if they choose to do so, you know, which we've heard are less toxic to the pollinators that we're. Well, the bees, but not the monarch butterflies and <laughs> moths. But I think, you know, we've seen, we've heard testimony from a number of sources that, that you know, given, given the choice when talking about pollinator protection, you know, using... Diamides is diamides preferable. To, and I, yeah. I understand that that yeah. is something like this, but... So I think that what one... Uh, in terms of the time timing, uh, my recollection is it was it was the testimony you heard from the golf courses. But they sprayed more often than once a year, maybe every two weeks after a certain point. But it was the orchards that sprayed once. How the way around? around. Okay. okay, all right. Thank you. Those of you who have better memories than I do. Um, in any case, the there is. There is a waiver exemption that would also be available to to golf courses. Golf courses. Yeah. Um, let's see who was next. I think I had my hand up. So uh, this is more uh, broader in terms of um, maybe addressing you know various various pesticides, including the diamides. Um, when looking at uh, some of the examples internationally, like Quebec, um, one of the things that they have is a program of, you know, $17 per acre insurance on, um, on crop failure based on the agreement not to use pesticides. And uh, we don't have any equivalent here. So what we're likely to find is that... Um, not only will we probably stop using the neonicotinoids, but then the diamides will become, the, and, and sure, maybe they are more 
God, I mean, more preferable, I, you know, what's the right language here, but um, there is an existing program, the, the Farm Agronomic Practice Program, and this is all from uh, Scott Sanderson, who sent me this. Um, uh, there's already practices which are being subsidized, like, for example, uh, um, rotational grazing, um, uh, yeah, cover cropping, exactly. So, I mean, could we also add something in there for not using pesticides? Uh, add something to make, make that practice also eligible. Indeed. Representative Race? Yeah, I would just, I think there's a lot of work we could do on, th on things like that on the sort of uh, the big picture. Over the next five years. Yeah, right? yeah. So, no, this is a big thing. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I don't think we have time to put it in this bill, but I think it needs to be said that, you know, we may just be dodging a bullet and being hit by another one. Yeah, I think you're, uh, yeah, absolutely. I think there's a lot of important sort of work to do over the next, over the next few years to set up this transition to be the best that it can, that, that it can be instead of just. And we have time because it's 29. So, yeah. So I want to make sure we leave time to come back to the, Yes. Uh, earlier point. Also, one one other that I don't think has come up yet is the exemption or um, shutting down the AIB's BNP. Uh, yeah. So I think we don't want to do that. Perhaps. Um, and thoughts on that? I agree. John, connected. I mean, I I don't know what the that sort of data driven waiver request is, but it. It would be nice if, if something like IPM was included in that, just so farmers, you know, sort of in a uniform way react to pest pressure. So if you're only going to lose, say, 30% of your crop, it's not necessarily maybe to go to a neonic or diamine type reactive IPM. It's that, you know, then you do something different the following year or change your, you know, plant up the grass the next year. So, you know, it would be nice if. The agency of ag had certain prescriptive IPM things that you could do before you turn to a mix of diamonds. Yeah, I think it's interesting that New York, that piece in the New York bill that I, that requires farms that would, that would be subject to, to a waiver to actually have undergone whatever, you know, this IPM training. Right, exactly. Provide that training or what that looks like, but. That would be interesting. I think maybe that would be interesting to sort of dig into again in these intervening years um, to see if that's something that could be integrated into whether it, whether it's whether we are charging the AIB with developing those BMPs and then that's part of those BMPs or yeah. So so it's section eight um, that's the repeal of the BMPs. Uh, so rather than repeal that. Uh, Part of its statute, <clears throat> leave that in, and possibly it was suggested earlier. Ex in fact, expand so that it's not just neonic treatises, but it's any treatises <clears throat> that are being or even sprays, right? That are best yeah. practices are being developed. Um, I don't know whether whether expanding to sprays makes it so it takes on so much more work that it wouldn't be the same group because um, I think a lot of the people in this group are. Well, no, that's not true. It's the, the AIB. I don't know. I, I would just want to better understand what we'd be asking if we did that. But I think at least having all treated seeds covered there would be, seems to make sense. So just so I understand, so what we, what we want to see is um, the, the process by which BMPs are created to, to remain and to, and to, go, and to be uh, done by the AIB. And the and they would be developing BMPs both for the use of neonicotinoid treated seeds in the case that a waiver has been granted, and for other treated seeds outside of those waivers. Yeah. Also, since the seeds will continue to be in use, would be sure. for yeah. another five years. That that's how. So on the on the orchard, this we heard from. Would passage of this affect his use of BMX? It wasn't during during bloom. It was based on an IBM strategy. I th I think that it would not yeah. affect his 
his, you know, the way he testified to his use of neonics, I think, would, would continue to be limited. Yeah. If, I, if I remember correctly, he was, and he, he referenced that and was just cautioning to a complete ban and how difficult it would be for especially right growing apples. Yeah. Did, did, did he need a waiver to, he, that, uh, homologist that testified, I think, was using uh, neonicotinoids four times a year. Right. And uh, so he got, he wouldn't need a waiver under this? No, so the only, the only piece that sort of governs that use is the, is the um, ban on the application during bloom. He right. already said that he's not applying. He actually he can do it four times a year, but a golf course uh, can never do it unless they get a waiver. That's yeah. That is that is correct. Yeah. yeah. So the ban, yeah, I have a problem. The ban that that impacts fruit farmers is during bloom. Um, the ban that impacts turf grass is. I mean, there's no bloom of turf grass, so. But there's a waiver option. But there is a waiver option. Whereas, for instance, there, well, I suppose the waiver, I suppose the fruit farmer could seek a waiver to apply during bloom, but. But it's not. Not likely. <laughs> so, um, Jed, to put it in perspective, I was doing some number crunching while we were being given testimony regarding how much of uh, this product is being used when comparing. Um, I forget who it was that was giving the testimony, but how much product is applied um, and, and directly transferred to the soils in a corn situation and in the Gulf situation. And um, it's a very similar amount per area that Gulf is under pressure. So what, what would be applied to a Gulf course is a very similar amount per area as what is applied in a corn field. I mean, I don't know if that matters to you, but but it mattered to me at the time. And I crunched the numbers and it seemed impactful to me because we're not talking about a small amount, right? I mean, what's considered, you know, a problem here is the amount being used in agriculture. If the amount is similar to that in golf, we need to look at it on the same level. And then if we look at um, the amount of area golf courses take in the state, it's about 125th of the amount of corn land that we're using. So it, if that means anything to you either, it's still a substantial amount of space that we're affecting. I did. I did. <laughs> That's how, how my yeah, brain works. I, 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 I don't know. I didn't know there was that much acreage. About 3,600 uh, acres of golf in Vermont. Uh, oh, fairways and green. Yeah, and then it's 90,000 of, of uh Corn, so that's about one twenty fifth. Yeah, but uh, it seems there were quite wide buffers, uh, right? Which the golf courses, but I assume in your calculation you reduce, you know, the buffers and all. No, I, I included it over the entire. I mean, I don't, I, I don't know golf well enough to know where well, they're applying. Either, but yeah. I know the testimony was not a significant. Area. Uh, well, then that means all golf. Uh, and then that means a concentrated usage in a smaller area, which greatly exceeds what's used in agriculture. And we've heard about soil uptake and water uptake, and and I, I would point out uh, again, trying to recall the testimony made in three weeks ago. They also talked about um, the. They, there are alternative uh, pesticides or chemicals that are uh, more harmful for, to the applicator. Mm. Uh, not that, look, I happen to be, have a very strong place in my heart for pollinators, uh, but uh, basically uh, we're saying, you know, who's ever applying them, you know, you're we're putting them at greater risk, but they have hazmat suits or whatever. And uh, licenses, the licenses and certification. 
Okay. Um, is there anything else as we um, ask <coughs> Representative Rice to um, meet with Michael Grady to bring us a draft of uh, of our changes? Yes. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so, so the the first is just is there consensus around that? What I described earlier, the sort of poison pill of the waiver and change. No, I think that's a good that's a good catch because without that change, I think it would make it difficult for the agency to ever give a waiver. Right, and that's not the intent or um, not our intent. And the other, the 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 final at, the, at this moment anyway, outstanding question I have. Um, circles back to something that I think Representative Graham brought up very early on in this conversation, which is that this doesn't actually ban the application of neonics in the soil, on the seeds, or in, in the field at, outside of the times that are specifically mentioned um, of corn and soybean and other cereals. So there are bans on the outdoor application to several different crop groups, leafy vegetables, perhaps against bold vegetables, herbs and spices, et cetera. Um, but those crop groups don't include the corn cereals and soy. And then there's a ban on the application um, for any crop between heading or tassel emergence and harvest. So that's specific times during corn's um, growth. But it doesn't, for instance, prevent the farmer from rigging his cedar to be applying neonics directly to the soil as it's planted. Um, so, so um, the way the bill is drafted in that regard, is it different from New York State's bill? And, and we can, I'm not yeah, asking you to look at it now, but I think that's a question. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I did have a preliminary conversation with Mike about that, and he did seem to, he didn't mention whether it was different from New York State, but he did sort of confirm that that is uh, a possible concern. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Check. It's a question from Mike. Didn't we hear testimony that it was when were they're applying neonicotinoids while they're planting that that created more opportunity for ambient distribution of the toxin to, to flow yeah to the, I, I mean, imagine that the, the, the seed treatment is very precise and and it, such it, application it, would probably sort of inherently be less precise yeah um now, so neonics have our, um, do require a pesticide applicator permit. Looking to be expert in the corner of the room. <laughs> strict use, yeah, strict use. Yeah. So, so that would, I suppose, limit the, to some extent, limit the number. We've heard some testimony that maybe fewer farmers are doing their own pesticide application with those restricted use, but but it, I think it, I think it's a fair. I think it's a, a concern. So, and I think what really you're pointing out is 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 this a loophole that right. um, we didn't, other than uh, Representative Graham, uh, pick up on earlier. Mm -hmm. And uh, if we are recognizing that now and closing the loophole, is that going to? Um, change anybody's perspective on the bill as a whole? Um, is it in fact different from what's in New York's bill? So bring that back to us tomorrow. I will. The answer, yeah, I mean, the second I, question. If, anyway. if I, yeah, so I'll, 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 I'll answer the New York, is it different from New York question tomorrow? I guess just sort of early, just first read, like if we, if we did sort of close that loophole, is that something that impacts anyone's overall perspective? Negatively, is that something? Is, is that sort of protection of that application something that feels important? Again, Absolutely. knowing that the waiver is really the protection for yeah. that, that that we're putting in place. I think essentially, what we would be saying is the waiver allows you to do what maybe right sort of seek is the proper yes. course yeah. to seek. Yeah. 
but so I would doubt that very many farmers would go back to buying their own. But you might find some but since you brought it up. Yeah. <laughs> some someone would just stop. <laughs> yeah. Do it anyway. Yeah. But you know, for the most part, I mean, no, it, not, you know, it takes more time. It's fun time to work later. You know, and I had to be right on that ball. Yeah. And they find me more apt to come in and spray with something else needed. Uh, it's a possibility. That's what you used to do. Okay. John, did you have a just a couple of like you probably know of, of potential unintended consequences or or things I can still want to trouble with is I guess neonics are used to treat ash and hemlock um or EAB or Lilia. Lilia gelatin, yeah. Um and so where would they be caught up in this? Josie brought that up. I'm sure yeah, I think it not, would not be restricted. Yeah, I don't read any restriction. Okay. Um, it's not I it's it's not, it's not, it's yeah, it's not. It's not any of the listing. Okay. And then as far as uh, that same sort of thing, I think maybe Matt just brought up both. both there's even agricultural plants that might use a drench or something in the starts that are brought in from outside. Does that fall under this restriction? Um, I, so my immediate answer is that it's it's about the outdoor application too. And so if that outdoor application is occurring in Vermont, then it is, but potentially you could buy something with it systemically in it already. Yeah, I don't have a plan. I don't yeah. know a little bit of soil with it. Right, either one. Yeah. I don't read a restriction. Uh, I can just like, I'll, I can ask. I can break up the mic tomorrow. Yeah. Okay. In. Yeah. yeah. You can give it, give me a heads up. Um, okay. So, and, and we will have another chance tomorrow when Mike's here. If there, if in the meantime you think of other things, uh, if you're reading through it and say, "Oh, what about this?" You know, we we're not moving this bill out tomorrow. Not my life, Mike. What do I do about that? <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, we will take a break. Uh, let's take ten minutes, and uh, then we'll be back to wrap up before three. <laughs>